the Project Gutenberg Gebok of the Swamp was upside down. By Marie Leinster, the Sebok is for the use of anyone anywhere in the United States and most other parts of the world at no cost and with almost no restrictions whatsoever. You may copy it, give it away or reuse it under the terms of the Project Gutenberg license included with this Sebok or online at WAF. Gutenberg. Or, if you are not located in the United States, you will have to check the laws of the country where you are located before using the Sebok. Title. The Swan Prize Upside Down Offer. Moe Leinster Release Date. August 18, 2020. We to Evoke 6,700 date retail language. English produced by Greg Wakes. Mary Meehan and the online distributed proofreading team at Dac D. Waf. Net start of the Project Gutenberg Gebook, The Swan Prize Upside Down, The Swan Prize Upside Down by Murray Leinster, illustrated by Three's Transcribers Note. This set text was produced from Astounding Science Fiction, September 1950. Skis. Extensive research did not uncover any evidence that the U.S. copyright on this publication was renewed. I hardly knew the survey ship had turned under Fend, because though there was artificial gravity, it does not affect the semicircular canals of the human ear. He knew he was turning head heralds, even though his feet stayed firmly on the floor. It was not a normal sensation, and he felt that queasy, instinctive tightening of the muscles with which one reacts to the abnormal, whether in things seen or felt. But the reason for turning the ship and fend was obvious. It had arrived very near its destination, and was killing its law of momentum. Just as Hardwick was assured that the turning motion was finished, young Barnish and ship's lowest ranking commissioned Off's grace into the wardroom and beamed at him kindly. The ship's not landing. So, he said gently, like one explaining something to somebody under ten years old, our orders are changed. You're to go to ground by boat. This way. So, Hardwick shrugged. He was a senior officer of the Colonial Survey, and this was a survey ship, and it had been sent especially to get him from his last and still unfinished job. It was a top urgency matter. This ship had had no other business for some months except to go after and bring him to sector headquarters, down on Kanawee, which must be somewhere near. But this young officer was patronizing him Hardwick rather regretfully recognized that he didn't know how to be impressive. He was not a good salesman of his own importance. He didn't even get the urgent respect due his rank and when one thought about it, it was amazing that he'd ever reached a high level in the survey. Now the young officer waited, brisk and kindly and blandly alert in manner. Hardwick reflected wryly that he could pin young Barnes ears back easily enough but he remembered when he'd been a junior survey ship's officer. Then he'd felt a serene condescension toward all people of whatever rank who did not spend their lives in the cramped, skimped quarters of a survey patrol shop. If this young Lieutenant Barnes were fortunate, he'd always feel that way. Hardwick could not begrudge him the copiness which made the tedium and hardships of the service seem to him a privilege. So he quite obediently followed Barnes through the wardroom door. He ducked his head under a ventilation slot and sidled past a standpipe with bristling air valve handles. It almost closed the way. There was the smell of oil and paint and ozone which all proper survey ships maintain in their working sections. Here, so, said Barnes paternally. This way, he offered his arm for Hardwick to steady himself back. Hardwick ignored it. He stepped over a complex of white painted packs. He arrived at an almost clear way to a boat blisters. And your luggage. So, added the young man reassuringly. We'll follow you down immediately. So, with the mail. Hardwick nodded. He moved toward the blistered door. He practically edged past constrictions due to new equipment. The survey ship had been designed a long time ago. And there were no funds for rebuilding when improved devices came along. So any survey ship was apt to be cluttered up with after thoughts in metal. A speaker from the wall sent sharply. Here this hold fast gravity going off hard whip caught at a nearby pep. 
and snatched his hand away agonet was had hunt cut on to another and then put his other hand below he applied a trifle of pressure the young officer said kindly hold fast sewed the ship's gravity is going off if i may suggest the gravity did go off hardwick grimaced there'd been a time when he was used to such matters this time the sudden outward surge of his breath caught him unprepared his diaphragm contracted as the weight of organs above it ceased to be he choked for an instant he was irritated he said evenly i am not likely to go head heralds lieutenant i served four years as a junior's watt on a ship exactly like this he did not float about he held on to a pipe in two places and he applied expert pressure in a strictly professional manner and his feet remained firmly on the floor he startled young barnes by the achievement which only junior swats think only junior swats know about barnes said abashed yes so he held himself firm in the same fashion i even know said hardwick crisply that the gravity had to be cut off because we were approaching another ship on Lowell Ravid. Our grave at Wakis would blow if we got into her field with our drive off, or if her field pressed ours inboard. Young Barnes looked extremely uncomfortable. Hardwick felt sorry for him. To be he would were for delicate a letter patronizing a senior officer could not be pleasant. So Hardwick added, and I also remember that, when I was a junior swat, I once tried to tell a sector chief how to top off his Switkins. So don't let it bother you, the young officer was embarrassed. But a sector chief was so high in the table of survey organization that one of his idle thoughts was popularly supposed to be able to crack a junior officer's skull. If Hardwick, as a young officer, had really tried to tell a sector chief how to top his Switkins, why, well, thank you, so said barnes awkwardly i'll try not to be an ass again so i suspect said hartwick that you'll slip occasionally i did what the devil's another ship doing out here in why aren't we ending i wouldn't know so said the young officer respectfully his manner toward hardwick was quite changed i do know the skipper came in expecting to land so by the land grid so he was told to stand off he's as much surprised as you are so the wall spake so crisply hear this gravity returning gravity returning and weight came back hardwick was ready for it this time and took it casually he looked at the speaker and it said nothing more he nodded to the young man i suppose i'd better get in the boat no change in that arrangement Anyhow, he crawled through the blister door and wormed his way into the landed ganda space for a more modern ship, and excessively inconvenient in such an outmoded launchy Vangsky. Barnes crawled in after him. Excuse me. So, I'm to take you down. He dogged the blister door from the inside, closed the boat toward and dogged it, and flipped a switch, ready for departure. He said into a microphone, a dial on the instrument board flicked halfway to zero. It's tapped there. Seconds passed. A green light glowed. The young officer said, All tight the needle darted a quarter way further over, and then began to descend slowly. The blister was being pumped empty of air. Presently another light glowed. Ready for launching, said the young officer briskly. There were clankings. The blister sleep broke and the two halves of the boat cover drew back. There were stars. To Hardwick they were in family arranged, but he could have picked out Seaton and the Donis cluster in any case, and half a hundred more markers by taking thought of the position of the planet Kanahimi, on which colonial survey sector headquarters for this part of the galaxy were established. The boat moved gently out of its place and the ship's gravity field ended as abruptly as such fields do. The survey ship floated away, as seen from the vision ports of the boat. It apparently increased its drive, because the boat's walled and swayed as changing yettercunes moved it. The ship grew small and vanished. The boat hung in emptiness. Turning slowly, 
the sun canna came into view it was very large for a salt pite sun and its rim was almost devoid of the prominences and jet streams of flaming gas that older suns of the type display but even out at the third orbit it provided zero and climatometer equivalent to her for the planet below the planet now came swinging into view as the ship's boat continued to turn it was blue more than ninety per cent of its surface was water and much of the solid land was under the northern ice cap it had been chosen as sector headquarters because of its sensitivity for a large population which might resent the considerable landery and needed for survey storage and reserve facilities hardwick regarded it thoughtfully the boat was of course roughly five planetary diameters out conventional distance to which a ship approached any planet on its own drive hardwick could see the ice cap very clearly and blue sea beyond it in the twilight and there was one cyclonic storm just dissipating toward the night side and the edge of a similar cloud stissed down toward the equator hardwick searched for headquarters it was on an island at about forty wood degrees latitude which ought to be near the center of the planet's surface as seen from where the ship's boat floated but he could not make it out there was only the one island of any importance and it was not large nothing happened the boat's rockets remained silent the young officer said quietly looking at the instruments before him he seemed to be waiting for something to happen a needle kicked and stayed just off the pin it was an external flood indicator some field somewhere now included the space in which the ship's boat floated hems said hartwick you are waiting for orders yes so said the young man i'm ordered not to land except underground instructions so i don't know why hardwick observed detachedly one of the worst withings i ever got was in a boat like this i was waiting for orders and they didn't come I acted very service about it. Stiff upper lip and all that. But I was getting in serious trouble when it occurred to me that it might be my fault I wasn't getting the orders. The young officer glanced quickly at an instrument he had previously ignored. Then he said relievedly, Not this time. So the communicators turned on. All right, Hardwick said. Do you think they might be calling you without shifting from Schiffrick since he they were talking to the ship? You know, I've tried. So, the young man leaned forward and switched to ship band adjustment of the communicator. Different wave bands, naturally, were used between a ship and shore, and a ship and its own boats. A booming carrier wave came in instantly. The young officer hastily turned down the volume and words became distinguishable. What the devil's the matter with you acknowledge the young officer gulped. Hardwick said mildly, since he ranks you. Just say sorry. So'd. Sorry, re. So'd. Said Barnes into the microphone. Sorry snapped the verse from the ground. I've been calling four or five minutes, your skipper will hear about this, I shall. Hardwick pulled the microphone before him. My name is Hardwick, he observed. I am waiting for instructions to land. My pilot has been listening on Botrif Kenchies, as was proper. You appear to be calling us on an improper channel. Really, there was strict and silence. Then babbled apologies from the speaker. Hardwick smiled faintly at young Barnes. It's quite all right. Let's forget it now. But will you give my pilot his instructions? The Vizzy said strangely. You're to be brought down by land a grid. So, rocket landings have been ruled non permitted by the sector chief himself. So, but they are already landing one boat. So, senior officer Werner is being brought in now. So, his boat is still two diameters out. So, and it will take us nearly an hour to get him down without extreme discomfort. So, then we'll wait, said Hartwick. Hems, call us again before you start hunting us with the landing bell. My pilot has a rather promising idea. And will you call us on the proper frequency then? Please, the Vosa ground said unhappily. Yes. So, certainly. 
sewed the caravory hum stopped yumbarn said gratefully thank you so he'll have no fury like a ranking officer caught in a blunder he'd have twisted my tail for his mistake sewed and it could have been bad then he paused he said uneasily buv beth pardoned so i haven't any promising ideas not that i know of you have an hour to develop one hardwick told him internally hardwick was disturbed there were few occasions on which even one senior officer was called into sector headquarters interstellar distances being what they were and thirty light speed being practically the best available senior officers necessarily acted pretty much as independent authorities to call one man and meant all his other work had to go by the board for a matter of months but juan werner werner was getting to ground first if there was something serious ashore werner would make a great point of arriving first even if only by hours a keen sort of person in giving the right impression he'd risen in the service faster than hardwick that other lawler field would have been his ship getting out of the way the young officer at his elbow fidgeted beth pardoned so what sort of idea should i develop so i'm not sure i understand it's rather annoying to have to stay parked in three fall said hardwick patiently and it's always a good practice to review annoying situations and see if they can be bettered barnes forehead wrinkled we could lend much quicker on rockets so if even when the land a grid reaches out for us since we've no grave at wakis they'll have to handle us very cautiously or they'd break our necks hardwick nodded barnes was thinking straight enough but it takes young officers a long time to think of thinking straight they have to obey so many orders and questioning that they tend to stop doing anything else yet at each rise in grade some slight trace of increased capacity to think is required in order to reach really high rank an officer has to be capable of thinking which simply isn't possible unless he's kept in practice on the way up young barnes looked up startled look here so he said surprised if it takes them an hour to let down senior officer werner from two planetary diameters it'll take much longer to let us down from out here true said hartwick and you don't want to spend three hours descending so after waiting an hour for him i don't admitted hardwick he could have given orders of course but if a junior officer were spurred to the practice of thinking it might mean that some day he'd be a better senior officer and hardwick knew how desperately few men were really adequate for high authority anything that could be done to increase the number young barnes blinked but it doesn't matter to the land grid how far out we are he said in an astonished voice they could lock on to us at ten diameters or at one once they lock the field fix on us when they move it they move us hardwick nodded again so so by the time they've got that other boat landed why i can use rockets and get down to one diameter myself sir and they can lock on to us there and let us down a few thousand miles only so we can get to ground half an hour after the other boats down instead of four hours from down just so agreed hardwick at a cost of a little thought and a little fuel you do have a promising idea after all lieutenant suppose you carry it out young barnes glanced at hardwick's safe strife he threw over the fuel ready lever and conscientiously waited the conventional few seconds for the first molecules of fuel to be catalyzed cold one firing started they'd be warm to detonatoridins in the last few millimeters of the injectiping firing so he said respectfully there was the curious sound of a rocket blasting in emptiness when the sound is conveyed only by the rocket is metal there was the smooth pushing sensation of acceleration the tiny ship's boat swung and dame down at the planet lieutenant barnes leaned forward and punched the ship's computer i hope you'll excuse me so he said awkwardly i should have thought that out myself so without prompting but problems like this don't turn up very often so 
as a rule it's wisest to follow precedents as if they were orders hardwick said dryly to be sure but one reason for the existence of junior officers is the fact that some day there will have to be new senior ones barnes considered then he said surprisedly i never thought of it that way so thank you he continued to punch the computer keys frowning hardwick relaxed in his seat held there by the gentle acceleration and the belt he had nothing by which to judge the reason for his summoning to headquarters he had very little now but there was trouble of some sort below two senior officers dragged from their own work warner noherdaf preferred not to estimate warner he disliked the man and would be biased but he was able though definitely on the make and there was himself they'd been called to headquarters where no ship was to be landed by a landigrid nor any rocket to come to ground a landigrid could pluck a ship out of space and plangimeters out and draw it with gentle violence shoreward and land it lightly as a feather a landigrid could take the heaviest loaded freighter and stop it in orbit and bring it down at eight gravities but the one below wouldn't land even a tiny survey ship and all and biteable was forbidden to come down on its rockets hardwick arranged those items in his mind he knew the planet below of course when he got his senior rating he'd spent six months at headquarters learning procedures and practices proper to his increased authority there was one inhabitable island two hundred miles long and possibly forty wide there was no other usable ground outside the arctic the one occupied island had gigantic cheer cliffs on its windward side where a great slab of bedrock had split along some submarine fault and tilted upward above the surface those cliffs were four fives and feet high but from them the island sloped very very gently and very gradually until its leeward shore slipped under the restless sea sector headquarters had been placed here because it seemed that civilians would not want to colonize so limited a world but there were civilians because there was headquarters and now every inch of ground was cultivated and there was irrigation and intensive farming in some hydroponic establishments but sector headquarters included a vast reserve very on which a space fleet might be marshaled in case of need the overcrowded civilians were bitter because of the great and cultivated area the survey needed for storage and possible emergency use even when hardwick was here years back there was bitterness because the survey crowded the civilian economy which had been based on it hardwick considered all these items he came to an uncomfortable conclusion presently he looked up the planet loomed larger much larger I think you'd better lose all planetward velocity before we hook on. He observed. The land grid crew might have trouble focusing on us so close if we are moving. Yes. So, said the young officer. I will. So, there's some sort of merry hell below. Said Hardwick Riley. It looks bad that they won't let a ship come down by grid. It looks worse that they won't let this one land on its rockets. He posed. I doubt they'll risk lifting us off again. Young Barnes finished his computations. He looked satisfied. He glanced at the new gigantic planet below. He deftly adjusted the course of the tiny boat. Then he jerked his head around. Excuse me. So, did you say we mightn't be able to lift off again? I could almost predict that we weren't. Said Hartwick. Would you? Could you say why? Sir, they don't want landings. The trouble is here. If they don't want landings, they won't want launchings. Werner and I were sent for, so presumably we are needed. But apparently there's uneasiness about even our landing. Surely they won't send us off again. I suspect the lad Piquer said tinnily. Calling boat from Landigrid, calling boat from Landigrid Common, said Barnes. But he looked uneasily at Hardwick. Correct your course, commanded the verse sharply. You are not to land on rockets under any circumstances. This is an order from the sector chief himself. Stand off, we will be ready to lock on and land you gently in about fifteen minutes. But meanwhile, stand off, yes. So, said young Barnes, 
Hardwick reached over and took the microphone. Hardwick speaking. He said, I'd like information. What's the trouble down there that we can't use our rockets? Rockets are nosy. So, even Motrictus. We have orders to prevent all physical vibration possible. So, but I am ordered not to give details on a transmitter. So, I'll sign off, said Hartwick. Fryly, he pushed the microphone away. He deplored his own lack of aggressiveness. Warner, but would have pulled his rank and insisted on being informed, but Hardwick couldn't help believing that there was a reason for orders that overrode his own. The young officer swung the rocket and fend. The sensation of pressure against the back of Hardwick's seat increased. Minutes later the speaker said, Grid to boat. Prepare for lock-in. Waddy. So, said Barnes. The small boat shuddered and leapt crazily. It spun. It oscillated violently through second loss arcs in emptiness. Very, very gradually. The oscillations died. There was a momentary sensation of the faint tugging of planetary weight, which is somehow subtly different from the feel of artificial gravity. Then the cosmos turned upside down as the boat was drawn very swiftly toward the watery planet below it. Some minutes later, young Bard spoke apologetically. Beth pardoned. So, he said diffidently, I must be stupid. So, but I can't imagine any reason why vibrations or nose should make any difference on a planet. How could it do harm this is an ospanity? Said Hartwick. It might make people drown. The young officer flushed. He turned his head away. And Hardwick reflected ruefully that the young were always sensitive. But he did not speak again. When they landed in the vast, Spittery land a grid of vast metal gridwork a full half-line hibernus would find out whether he was right or not. Aged. And Hardwick was right. The people on Kennery were anxious to avoid vibrations because they were afraid of drowning. Their fears seemed to be rather well-founded. He three hours after landing, Hardwick moved gingerly over grayish muddy rock. With a four faust in what sheer dropped some twenty yards away, the ragged edge of a cliff fell straight down for the better part of a mile. Far below, the sea rippled gently. Hardwick so long. Long line of boats moving slowly out to sea. They towed something between them which reached from boat to boat in exaggerated catenary curves. The boats moved in line abreast straight out from the cliffs, towing this floating, curved thing between them. Hardwick regarded them for a moment and then inspected the grayish mud underfoot. He lifted his eyes to the inland side of this peculiar stretch of mountainside muddiness. There was a mast on the rock not far away. It held up what looked like a Vissian sparrant. Young Barnes said, Excuse me. So, what are those boats doing there towing an Olsic out to sea? Said Hardwick absently, by owing a floating line of some sort between them. There isn't enough oil to maintain the slick, and it's blown landward, so they toned out to sea again. It holds down the seas. Every time, of course, they lose some of it. But there are trade winds, said Hartwick, not looking to seaward at all. They always blow in the same direction. Nearly, they blow freighters of the way around the planet, and they build up seas as they blow. Normally, the swells that pound against this cliff here will be a hundred feet and more from crest to crest. They'll throw spray end times that have, of course, and once when I was here before. Spray came over the cliff tap. The impacts of the waves are heavy. In a storm, if you put your ear to the ground on the leeward shore, you can hear the waves smash against these cliffs. It's vibration. Barnes looked uneasily at the cliff's edge and the line of boats pushing sturdily over an ocean whose waves seemed less than ripples from nearly a mile above them. But the line of boats was incredibly long. It was twenty miles in length at the least. And between each two boats there was the long curved line of something being towed on the surface. Mm. Slick holds down the waves. Barnes guessed. It works best in deep water. I believe. 
the ancients knew it, all on the waters. He considered, working hard to prevent vibrations, are they really so dangerous? So Hardwick nodded inland. If, at a quarter mile from the edge of the cliff, there was a peculiar, broken, riven rampart of soil. It might have been forty feet high. Once, now it was chattered and cracked. It had the quite incredible look of having been pulled away from where Hardwick stood, and of having partly disintegrated as it was withdrawn. There were vertical breaks in its edges. There were broken fun masses left behind. At one place a clump of perhaps a quarter car had not followed the rest, and trees leaned drunkenly from its top, and at the it had fallen outward, and all along the top of the stone cliff, for as far as that I could see, there was this singular retreat of soil and vegetation from the cliff's edge. Hardwick stooped and picked up a bit of the mud underfoot. He rubbed it between his fingers. It yielded like modeling clay. He dipped a finger into a gray, greasy zinc puddle. He looked at the thick liquid on his finger and then rubbed it against his other palm. Young Barnes duplicated this last action. It feels soapy, sir, he said blankly. Mac, what's so pless? said Hartwick. That's the first problem here. He turned to a grounds this survey private. He jerked his head along the coast line. How much of other places slipped anywhere from this much? Sowed, said the private, to two miles and upward. There's one place where it's moving at a regular rate. Four inches an hour. Sowed. It was for Haffel yesterday. Hardwick nodded. Hems, we'm go back to headquarters. Nasty business he plodded over the extraordinarily messy footing toward the vehicle which had brought him here. It was not an ordinary ground car. Instead of tires or caterwheels, it rolled upon flaxid, partal and tied five-foot rollers. They would be completely unaffected by roughness or slipperines of terrain, and if the vehicle fell overboard it would float. But it was thickly coated with the gray mud of this cliff tap. As he moved along, Hardwick was able to see the pattern of the rock underneath the mud. It was curiously contorted, like something that had curdled rather than cooled. If, as a matter of fact, it was believed to have solidified slowly under water at such monstrous pressure that even molten rock could not make it burst into steam, but it was ebb of water now. Hardwick climbed into the vehicle, and Barnes followed him. The bowl struck turned. It moved toward the broken barrier of earth. Its five-foot flubby rollers seemed rather to flow over than to surmount obstacles. Great lumps of drier dirt dented them and did not disintegrate. There were no stones. Hardwick frowned to himself. The bowl struck more or less flowed up the crumbling, inexplicably drobin mass of surl, a cockpit. Things looked almost normal. Almost there was a highway leading away from the cliff. At first glance it seemed perfect, but it was cracked down the middle for a hundred yards, and then the crack may entered off to the side and was gone. There was a great tree, which leaned drunkenly. A mile along the roadway its surface buckled as if something had pressed irresistibly upward from below. The truck rolled over the break. It was notable that the motion of the truck was utterly smooth, it made no vibration at all. But even so, its load before it moved through a place where Haustfeldens and a shop port wall custard closely together on each side of the road. There were people in and about the houses, but they were doing nothing at all. Some of them stared hostily at the survey truck. Some others deliberately turned their backs to it. There were vehicles out of shelter and ready to be used. But none was moving. Alvary oddly were pointed in the direction from which the ball struck had come. The truck went on. Presently the extraordinary flatness of the landscape became apparent. It was possible to see a seemingly illimitable distance. The ocean forty miles away showed as a thread of blue beneath the horizon. The island was an almost perfectly plain surface. But the windward side was tilted up to a height of four thousand feet above the sea, and the downwind side slipped gently beneath the waves. There was no hill visible anywhere. No mountains. 
no valleys save the extremely minor gullies worn by rains even they had been filled in or dammed and tied into irrigation systems there was a place where there was a row of trees along such a water couse half the row was fallen and a part of the rest was tilted the remainder stood upright and firm all the vegetation was perfectly familiar most colonies have some vegetation at least directly descended from the mother planet earth but this island on canny we had been ab of water perhaps no more than three or four thousand years there had been no time for local vegetation to develop when the survey took it over there was only tidal seaweed only one variety of which had been able to extend itself in web-like fashion over the surreal above water terrestrial plants had wiped it out and everything was green and everything was human repentance but there was something wrong with the ground at this place the top of the soul bulged and tall corpults grew extravagantly in different directions there there was an arrow lipless gap in the ground's surface and irrigation it had poured water into it it was not filled barnes said distressedly excuse me sowed but how the devil did this happen there's been irrigation said hardwick patiently the soul here was all ocean sobbit on used to be what is called lobigree in a sous there's no scent there are no stones there's only bedrock and formerly abyssal mud and i'm a bit underneath is no longer former it's lobigree in a sous again he waved his hand at the landscape it had been remarkably tidy once every square foot of ground had been cultivated the highways were of limited width and the houses were neat and trim it was perhaps the most completely civilized landscape in the galaxy but hard recatted you said the stuff felt like soap in a way it's acted like soap it lies on slightly slanting effectively smooth rock like a soap take on a slightly slanting sheet of metal and that's the trouble so long as a cake of soap is dry on the bottom it doesn't move even if you pour water on top like plaint the top will wet and the water will flow off but the bottom won't wet until all the soap is dissolved away while that was the process here everything was all right but they've been irrigating they passed a row of neat cottages facing the road one had collapsed completely the others looked absolutely normal the bowl struck went on hardwick said frining they wanted the water to go into the soul so they arranged it a little of that did no harm plants growing dried it out again one tree evaporates thousands of gallons a day in a good trade wind there were some landslides in the early days especially when stormels pounded the clefts but on the whole the ground was more firmly anchored when first cultivated than it had been before the colonists came bitter regentian the seas not fresh is it water freshening plants said hardwick dryly i in auctioning systems they installed them and had all the fresh water they could wish for and they wished for a lot they deeple would so the water would sink in they damned the water concerned it sank in but they did amounted to something like boring holes in the cake of soap i used for an illustration just now water went right down to the bottom what would happen then barnes said why well, the bottom would wet and slide as if it were greased not greased corrected hardwick soaped soap is viscous that is different meant at a lucky difference but the least vibration would encourage movement and it does it has so the population is now walking on eggs worse it's walking on the equivalent of a cake of soap which is getting wetter and wetter on the bottom it's already sliding as a viscous substance doris lectinty but in spite of the oil sick they're trying to keep in place upward and there's still some battering from the sea there are still some vibrations in the bedrock and so there's a slow and gentle and gradual sliding and they figure said barnes abruptly that locking onto a ship with the land a grid might be like an earthquake he stepped out oakquake 
Now not much volcanism on this planet, Hardwick told him. But of course there are tectonic quakes occasionally. They made this island. Bar and seven easily. I don't think, sowed, that I'd sleep well if I lived here. You are living here for the moment. But at your age I think you'll sleep. The bowl struck turned, following the highway. The road was very even and the motion of the truck along it was infinitely smooth. Its lack of vibration explained why it was permitted to move when all other vehicles were stopped. But Hardwick reflected uneasily that this did not account for the orders of the sector chief forbidding the rockletending of a ship's boat. It was true enough that the livings circle of the island rested upon slanting stone, and that if the bottom were wet enough it could slide off into the sea. It already had moved. At least one place was moving at four inches per hour. But that was discus flow. It would be enhanced by vibration. And assuredly the hammering of seas upon the windward cliff should be lessened by any possible means. But it did not mean that the sound of a rockle tending would be disastrous. Nor that the straining of a land grid as it stopped a spaceship in orbit and drew it to ground should produce all and slide. There was something else by the situation for the island's civilian population was assuredly serious enough. If any really massive movement of the ground did begin, discus or any other, if any considerable part of the island's surface did begin to movail of it would go, and the population would go with it. If there were survivors, they could be numbered in dozens. The tall Tampaford wall of the headquarters reserve very loom ahead, Sector headquarters had been established here when there were no other inhabitants. Seeds had been broadcast and trees planted while the survey buildings were under construction. Headquarters, in fact, had been built upon an uninhabited planet. But colonists followed in the wake of survey personnel, wives and children, and then storekeepers and agricultural testers, and presently civilian technicians and ultimately even politicians arrived as the non-service population grew. Now sector headquarters was resented because it occupied one-fourth of the island. It kept too much of the planet's useful surface out of civilian use. And the island was now desperately overcrowded. But it seemed also to be doomed. As the ball struck moved silently toward headquarters, a hundred-doored section of the wall collapsed, there was an observing of dust. There was a rumbling of falling. Hardened wall. The truck's driver turned white. A civilian beside the road faced the wall and wrung his hands, and stood waiting to feel the ground under his feet begin to sweep smoothly toward the hair distant sea. A post held up a traffic signal some twenty yards from the gate. It leaned slowly. At a fortifisted tilt it checked and hung stationary, fifty yards from the gate. A new crack appeared across the road, but nothing more happened. Deafing, yet one could not be sure that some critical point had not been passed, so that from now on there would be a gradual rise in the creeping of the soil toward the ocean. Barnes caught his breath. That makes one feel queer. He said on Stadilaby, at the shock like that wall falling could start everything off Hardwick said nothing at all, it had occurred to him that there was no irrigation of the survey area. He frowned very faint, fubbling worriedly. As the truck went inside the headquarters gate and rolled smoothly on over a winding road through definitely park-like surroundings, it stopped before the building which was the sector chief's own headquarters in headquarters. A large brown dog dozed peacefully on the plastic old landing at the top of half a dozen steps. When Hardwick got out of the truck, the dog got up with a leisurely air. When Hardwick ascended the steps, with Barnes following him, the dog came forward with a sort of stately courtesy to do the honors. Hardwick said, Nice dog. That. He went inside. The dog sedately followed. The interior of the building was singularly empty. There was a sort of resonant silence until somewhere a tellwarter began to click. Come along, said Hartwick. The sector chief's office is over this way. Young Barnes followed in comfortably. It seems odd there's no one around. No secretaries. No sentries. Nobody at all. 
Why should there be asked Hardwick in surprise? The guards at the gate keep civilians out, and nobody in the service will bother the chief without reason. At least, not more than once, but across a glistening. Empty floor there ran an ominous crack. They went down a corridor. Bursus sounded it, and Hardwick tracked them. With the pause of the door clicking on the floor behind him, he led the way into a spacious, comfortably nondescript room with high windowsers. Rail of fate opened on green lawn outside. The sector chief, Sandry Hem, leaned placidly back in a chair, smoking. Warner, another summoned senior officer, sat bolt upright in a chair facing him. Sandra Hem waved a hand cordially to Hardwick. Back so soon you're ahead of schedule on all counts, here's Warner. Back from looking at the full store situation. Hardwick suddenly looked as if he'd been jolted, but he nodded, and Werner tried to smile and failed. He was completely white. My pilot from the ship, who's kept aground, said Hartwick. Lieutenant Barnes, very promising young officer, cut mile and mutt by hours. Lieutenant, this is Sector Chief Sandraham and Mr. Warner. Have a seat. Hardwick, grunted the chief. Oh, oh, lieutenant, how does it look up on the cliff? Hardwick, I suspect you know as well as I do, said Hartwick. I think I saw a Vissian's car and planted up there. True enough, but there's nothing like on feet pot inspection. Now you're back. How does it look to you inadequate? said Hardwick with some dryness. Inadequate to explain some things I've noticed. But it's a very bad situation. Its degree of badness depends on the viscosity of the mud at bedrock all over the island. The left bend in mud's like pea soup. It looks really bad, but what's the viscosity at bedrock with soil pressing down, and I hope drier soil than at the bottom, Sandraham grunted. Good question. I sent for you. Hardwick. When it began to look bad, before the ground really started sliding, when I thought it might begin any time. The viscosity averages pretty closely at three times ten to the sixth, which still gives us some leeway, but not enough. Not nearly enough, said Hardwick impatiently. Irrigation should have been stopped a long while back, the sector chief grimaced. I've no authority over civilians. They've their own planetary government. And do you remember, he quoted, Civilian establishments and governments may be advised by colonial survey officials, and may make requests of them, but in each case such advice or request is to be considered on its own merits only, and in no case can it be the subject of a quid quo pro agreement. He added grimly, that means you can threaten. It's been thrown at my head every time I've asked them to cut down their irrigation in the past fifteen years I advised them not to irrigate at all and they couldn't see it. It would increase the food sploop, and they needed more food. So they went ahead. They built two new seaway to freshening plants only last year. Werner licked his lips. He said in a voice that was hypertight than Hardwick remembered. What's happening serves them right, it serves them right, Hardwick waited. But, said Sandra Hem, they are demanding to be let into sector headquarters for safety, they say we have interrogated. So the ground we occupy isn't going to slide. They demand that we take them all in here to sit on their rumps until the rest of the island slides into the sea or doesn't. If it doesn't, they want to wait here until the soul becomes stable again because they've quit irrigating. It'd serve them right if we let them in, cried Werner in shrill anger. It's their fault that they're in this fix. Sandraham waved his hand. Administering abstract justice isn't my job. I imagine it's handled in more competent quarters. I have only to meet the objective situation. Wakipo is displenty hardwick. You've handled swamplenty situations. But can be done to stop the sliding of the Nile and soul before it all goes overboard? Not much. Offhand, said Hartwick. Give me time and I'll manage something. But a really bad storm with high seas and plenty of rain, might wipe out the whole civilian colony. That disposity figure is close to hope or seeks not quite. 
The sector chief looked impassive. How much time does he have? Warner Nunn said Warner shrilly. The only possible thing is to try to move as many people as possible to the solid ground in the Arctic. The boats can be crowd fight situation demands it and if the two spacecraft in orbit are sent to collect a fleet. And as many people as possible are moved at on this or maybe some survivors Hardwick spread out his hands. I'm wondering, he observed, what the really serious problem is. There's more than sliding so all the matter else you would. I'm sure Lieutenant Barnes has thought of this. Let the civilian population into headquarters to sit on its rump and wait for better times. Sandra Hem glanced at young Barnes, who flushed hotly at being noticed. I'm sure you have good reasons. So, he said embarrassed. I have several, said the sector chief Riley. For one thing, so long as we refuse to let them in, they're reassured. They can't imagine we'd let them down. But if we invited them and they'd panic and fight to get in first, there'd be a full sockle slaughter right there. They'd be sure disaster was only minutes off. Which it would be, he paused and glanced from one to the other of the senior officers. When I said for you, he said wryly, I meant for you, Hardwick, to take care of the possible sliding. I meant for Werner, here, to do the public rational's job of scaring the civilians just enough to make them let it be done. It's not so simple. Now he drew a deep breath. It's pure chance that there is a sector headquarters. Or else it's providence. We'll find that out later, but ten days ago it was discovered that an instrument had gone wrong over in the ship fuel storage area. It didn't register when a tank leaked. And a tank did leak. You know shipful's harmless when it's refrigerated. You know what it's like when it's not. Dissolved in soil, mister. It's not only catalyzed to explosive condition, but it's a hell of a corrosive. And it's seat in holes in some other tanks, and can you imagine trying to do anything about that Hardwick felt a sensation of incredulous shock? Werner wrung his hands. If I could only find the man who made that faulty tank, he said thickly. He's killed all of us all unless we get to solid ground in the Arctic, the sector chief said calmly. That's why I won't let them in. Hardwick. Our storage tanks go down to bedrock. The leaked foiluder mup. New seeping along bedrock and eating at other tanks, besides being absorbed generally by the soil and dissolving in the groundwater. We've pulled all personnel out of all the area it could have seeped down to. Hardwick felt slightly cold at the back of his neck. I suspect, he said wryly, that they came out on tick tank, holding their breaths, and that they were careful not to drop anything or scrape their chairs when they got up to leave. I would have anything. Of course, could set it off. But it is bound to go anyhow, of course. Now I see why we couldn't make a rock ding the chilly feeling seemed to spread as he realized more fully. When ship fuel is refrigerated during its manufacture, it is about as safe a substance as can be imagined so long as it is kept refrigerated. It is an enger chemical and compound of atoms bound together with force valence linkages. But enormous amounts of energy are required to force valences upon reluctant atoms. When ship fuel warms up, or is catalyzed, it goes on one step beyond the process of its manufacture. It goes on to the modification the refrigeration prevented. It changes its molecular configuration. But was stable because it was cold becomes something which is hysterically unstable because of its structure. The touch of a feather can detonate it. A shout can set it off. It is, indeed, burned only molecule by molecule in a ship's engines, being catalyzed to the unstable state while cold at the very spot where it is to detonate. And since the energy yielded by detonation is that of the forced bonds, why, well, the enrojectant of ship fuel is much greater than a merely chemical compound can contain. Ship fuel contains a measurable fraction of the power of atomic explosive. But it is much more practical for use on board ship. The point now was, of course, that leaked into the ground and warmed. Why, well, practically any vibratory motion will detonate it, even dissolved. 
It can detonate because it is not a chemical but an endorealgies action. Above. Drumming. Heavy rain. Said Sandraham very calmly indeed. Which falls on the end of the island. Will undoubtedly set off some scores of tons of leaked ship fuel. And that ought to scatter and catalyze and detonate the rest. The explosion should be equivalent to at least a megaton fusion bomb. He posed, and added with irony, Pretty situation. Isn't it if the civilians had interrogated? We could evacuate headquarters and let it ball as it will anyhow. If the fuel hadn't leaped, we could let in the civilians until the island soil decides what it's going to do. Either would be a nasty situation. But the combination, Werner said shrilly, Evacuation to the Arctic is the only possible answer. Some people can be saved. Some I'll take a boat and equipment and go on ahead and get some sort of refuge ready. There was dead silence. The brown dog, who had followed Hardwick from the outer terrace, nigh nod lively. Hardwick reached over and absentedly scratched his ears. Young Barnes swallowed. Beck pardoned. So, he said awkwardly, but what's the weather forecast continued fair? Said Sandraham pleasantly. That's why I had Hardwick and Werner come down. Free heads are better than one. I've gambled their libs on their brains. Hardwick continued thoughtfully to scratch the brown dog's ears. Werner licked his lips. Young Barnes looked from one to another of them. Then he looked back at the sector chief. So, he said awkwardly, at I think the odds are pretty good. Mr. Hardwick. Searle managed, then he flushed hotly at his own presumption in saying something consoling to a sector chief. It was comparable to telling him how to top off his vacuum suit tanks. But the sector chief nodded in grave approval and turned to Hardwick to hear what he had to say. Ewe the leeward side of the island went very gently into the water. From a boat ops her seat. A couple of miles out shoreline looked low and flat and peaceful. There were houses in view, and there were boats afloat, but they were much smaller than those that had been towing a twenty mole in Malsic out to sea. These boats did not ply back and forth. Most of them seemed anchored. On some of them there was activity. Men went overboard, without splashing, and things came up from the ocean bottom and were dumped inside their hulls and then baskets went back down into the water. At long intervals, at long intervals, men emerged from underwater and sat on the sides of the boats and smoked with an effect of leisure. There was sunshine, and the land was green, and a seeming of vast tranquility hung over the whole sea stack. But the small service personal recruitation had moved in toward the shore, and the look of things changed. At a mile, a mass of green that had seemed to be trees growing down to the water's edge became a thicket of tumbled trunks and overset branches where a tree thicket had collapsed. At half a mile the water was opaque. There were things floating in it he roof of a house. The leaves of an ornamental shrub, with nearby its roots showing at the surface. Washed clean, a child sturbobbed past the boat. It looked horribly pathetic. There were the exotic plains and angles of free wooden steps, floating in the ripples of the great ocean, ignoring the imminent explosion of the fuel store. Said Hardwick dryly, We need to find out something about what has to be done to the soil to stop its creeping. I hope you remembered, Lieutenant, to ask a great many useless questions. Yes. So, said Barnes. I tried to. So, I asked everything I could think of. Those boats yonder Hardwick indicated a boat from which something like a wire basket splashed into the water as he gestured. A guarded boat. So, said Barnes, on this side of the Nile and the sea bottom slopes so gradually. So, that there are sea gardens on the bottom. Shell fish from Merck do not thrive. So, but there are edible sea plants. The gardeners cultivate them as on land. So, Hardwick reached overside and carefully took his twentieth sample of the sea water. He squinted, and estimated the distance to shore. I shall try to imagine someone wearing a diving mask and using a hull. He said dryly, What's the depth here? We are half a mile out. 
sewed, said Barnes promptly. It should be about sixty feet. Sewed. The bottom seems to have about a three percent grade. Sewed. That's the angle of repose of the mud. There's no and to make a steeper slope possible. Three percents not bad Hardwick looked pleased. He picked up one of his earlier samples and tilted it, checking the angle at which the sediment came to rest. The bottom mud, here, was essentially the same as the sole of the land, but the soil of the island was infinitely finnily davity. In fresh water it floated practically like a collode. In seawater, obviously, it sank because of the salinity which made suspension difficult. You see the point. And he asked, when Barnes shook his head. Hardwick explained, probably for my sins I've had a good deal to do with swamp planets. The mud of a salt swamp is quite different from a freshwater swamp. The essential trouble with the people ashore is that by their irrigation they've contrived an iced lounge swamp which happens to be upside down from mud at the bottom. So the question is, can it acquire the properties of a salt swamp instead of a freshwater swamp without killing all the vegetation on the surface? That's why I'm after these samples. As we go inshore, the water should be fresher on a shallowing shore like this with drainage in this direction. He gestured to the survey private at the stern of the boat. Closer in, pleased, Barnes said. So, motor boats are forbidden inshore. The vibrations. Hardwick shrugged. We will obey the rule. I've probably samples enough. How far out do the mud flats run at the surface? About two hundred yards at the surface. So, the mud's about the consistency of thick cream. You can't see where the ripples stop. So, Hardwick stared. He turned his eyes away. At so, said Barnes unhappily. Mayor asked. So Hardwick said dryly. You may, but the answer's pure theory. This information will do no good at all unless all the rest of the problem we face is solved. But solving the rest of the problem will do no good if this part remains unsolved. You see, yes, so above the others hear more. Agent, so Hardwick shrugged. There was a shout from a nearby boat. Men were pointing ashore. Hardwick jerked his eyes to the shoreline. A section of seemingly solid ground moved slowly toward the water. Its forefront seemed to disintegrate, and a singularly slumbering swell moved out over the rippleless border of the sea, where mudbanks like thick cream reached the surface. The moving mass was a good half lion in width. Its outer edge dissolved in the sea, and the top tilted, and green vegetation leaned downwind and very deliberately subsided into the water. It was remarkably like the way an ingot of nofnares metal slides into the pool made by its own melting, but the aftermath was somehow horrifying. When the tumbled soil was all deserved lawn, the grass undulated like a floating meadow on the water hair remained a jagged shallow gap in the land bank. There were irregularities. Botical striations and dun of neenses in the exposed, broken soul. Hardwick snatched up glasses and put them to his eyes. The shore seemed to leap toward him. He saw the harsh outlines of the temporary cliff go soft. The bottom ceased to look like soil. It glistened. It moved outward in masses which grew rounder as they swelled. They flowed after the now venchied fallen stuff into the water. The top sole was suddenly undercut. The wetter material under it flowed away leaving a ledge which bore carefully tended flowering shrubberdosh for could see specks of color which were there blossom and a bright opacard small trim house in which some family had lived the flowway of the deeper soul made a greater more cavernous hollow beneath the surface it began to collapse the house teetered it fell it smashed more soul dropped down and more and more presently there was a depression a sort of valley leading inland away from the sea. In what had been a rampart of green at the water's edge, it was still green, but through the glasses Hardwick could see that trees had fallen, and a white canted fence was splintered, and there was still movement. The movement slowed and slowed, but it was not possible to say when it stopped. 
in reality it did not stack the island soul was still flowing into the notion barnes drew a deep breath at thought that was it so he said shakily a meat that the whole island would start sliding the ground's a bit more water skate down here hardwick said briefly inland the bottom sewell's not nearly as fluid as here but i'd hate to have a really heavy rain fall right now barnes mind jerked back to the sector chief's office the drumming would set off the chip fuel among other things said hartwick yes then he said abruptly how good are you at precision measurements i've messed around on swamp planets i know a bit too much about what i ought to find which is not good for accuracy can you take these bottles and measure the rate of sedimentation and plot it against salinity eyes so i've tried so if we had soil acognitus enough said hardwick vexedly we could handle that upside down swamp the civilians have so carefully made here but we haven't got it but the fresh and sea water they've been irrigating with is practically mineral for i want to know how much mineral content in the water would keep the swamp should from acting like wet soap it's entirely possible that we'd have to make the soil too salty to grow anything in order to anchor it but i want to know barnes said uncomfortably wouldn't you so wouldn't you have to put the minerals in a riga to knit her to get them down to them the swamp hard with grinned very surprisingly you've got promise bar is yes i would and it would increase the rate of slide before it stopped it which could be another problem but it was good work to think of it when we get back to headquarters you commandeer a laboratory and make those measurements for me yes so said barnes we'll start back now said hartwick the reprochation about obediently turned it went out to sea until the water flowing past its hull was crescalier and hardwick seemed to relax on the way they passed more small boats many of them were gardeners boats from which men dived with diving masks to tend or harvest the cultivated guard pintocks not too far down but many were pleasure boats from double-hulled sailing craft intended purely for sport too sturdy those small cabin cruisers which could venture far out to sea or even around to the windward of the island for sports fined all the pleasure craft were cowered where there were usually some children it was noticeable that on each one there were always some faces turned toward the shore that said hartwick makes for emotional thinking these people know their danger so they packed their children and their wives into these little cockle shells to try to save them they're waiting offshore here to find out if they're doomed regardless i wouldn't say he nodded toward a delicately designed twin hull sailor with more children than adults a bardy wouldn't call that a good substitute for an arc young barnes fidgeted the boat turned again and went parallel to the shore toward where headquarters land came down to the sea the ground was firmer there there had been no irrigation lateral seepage had done some damage at the edge of the reserve but the major part of the shoreline was unbroken and changed solid ground looming above the beach there was of course no sand at the edge of the water there had been no weathering of rock to produce it when this island was appraised its coating of hardened dews protected the stern the small lee side waves merely lapped upon bare curdled rock the wharf for pleasure boats went out on metal pilings into deep water excuse me so said young barnes embarrassed he but if the fuel blows it'll be pretty bad so that's the understatement of the century hardwick commented yes it will why you've something in mind so to try to save the rest of the island nobody else seems to know what to do if if i may say so so your safety is pretty important and you could do your work on the cliffs so if if i could stay at headquarters and he stopped appalled at his own presumption in suggesting that he could substitute for a senior officer even as a messenger be and even for his convenience or safety he began to stammer i may mean so 
meant that I'm capable of it. Sir stops tamering. Brunted Hardwick. There aren't two separate problems. There's one which is the compound of the two. I'm staying at headquarters to try something on the ship fuel side. And Warner will specialize on the rest of the Nile, and since he hasn't come up with anything but shifting people to the ice pack. And the situation isn't hopeless if there's an earthquake or a storm. Of course we'll be wiped out. But short of one of those calamities, we can save part of the island. I don't know how much, but some. You make those measurements. If you're doubtful, vet a headquarters man to duplicate them. Then give me both sets. Guys, sewed, said young Barnes, miserably, F, said Hardwick formidably. Never try to push your ranking officer into a safe place. Even if you're willing to take his risk, would you like it if a man under you tried to put you in a safe place while he took the chance that was yours, Nano? Sir admitted the very junior lieutenant. But make those measurements, snapped Hardwick. The boat came into the dock. Hardwick got out of the boat. He went to Sandraham's office. Sandraham was in the act of listening to somebody in the Phobsenreek, who apparently was on the fin edge of hysteria. The brown doll was sprawled asleep on the rug when the man in the visons companted to a stock. Sandraham said calmly, I am assured that before the soul of the island is too far gone, measures now in preparation will be applied to good effect. A senior survey officer is now preparing remedial measures. He is a, a specialist in problems of exactly this nature. But we can't wait, panted the civilian fiercely. I'll proclaim a planetary emergency. We'll take over the reserve area by force we have to if you try. Sandrahem told him grimly. I'll mount Paralizigans to stop you, he said with icy precision. I urged the planetary government to go easy on this irrigation. You yourself denounced me in the planetary council for trying to interfere in civilian affairs. Now you want to interfere in survey affairs. I resent it as much as you did and with much better reason murderer panted the civilian. Murderer Sandrahem snapped off the Phobsnerik. He swung his chair and nodded to Hardwick. That was the planetary president. He said dryly. Hardwick sat down. The brown all blinked his eyes open and then got up and shook himself. I'm holding off those idiots, said the sector chief in suppressed fury. I daren't tell him it's more dangerous here than outside if or when that fuel blows or you realize that the falling of a single tree limb might set off an explosion in the reserve or hear that wold, but you know. Yes, admitted Hardwick. He did know. Even forty tons of ship fuel going off would destroy this entire end of the island. It would be at least the equivalent of a megaton fusion bomb explosion and almost certainly the concussion would produce violent movement of the rest of the violent surface. But he wasn't comfortable about putting forward his own ideas. He was not a good salesman. He suspected his own opinions until he had proved them with extremely painstaking care for fear of having them adopted on his past record rather than because they were sound. And then, though, his plan involved junior ranks being informed about the proposal, if they accepted a dubious plan on high authority. And the plan miscarried. It made them share in the mistake, which hurt their self-confidence. Young Barnes, but would undoubtedly obey any order and accept any hint blindly. And Hardwick honestly did not know why. But as a matter of the training of junior ranks about the work to be done, said Hartwick, I imagine the sea waiter freshening plants have closed down, they have said Sandrahem curtly. They insisted on piling them up over my protests. Now if anybody proposed operating one, they'd scream to high heaven Hardwick felt uncomfortable. But was done with the minerals taken out of the seawater, you know how the fresheners work, said Sandrahem. They pump seawater in at one end, and at the other, one pipe yields fresh water, and another heavy brine. They dump the heavy brine back overboard and the fresh water is pumped up and distributed through the irrigation systems. It's too bad some of the salts weren't stored, said Hartwick. Could a freshener be started up against, and Rahim said with irony, Oat, 
The civilians would love that no if any man started up a water furchin. The civilians would kill him and smash it, but I think we'll need one. We'll want to irrigate some ground up here. My God, what for demanded Sandraham. Then he said shortly, No, don't tell me, let me try to work it out. There was silence. The brown dog blinked at Hardwick. He held out his hand. The dog came sedately to him and bent his head to be scratched. Hardwick scratched. After a considerable time, the sector chief growled. I give up. Do you want to tell me, Hardwick said painstakingly. In a sense, the trouble here is that there's a swamp underground, made by irrigation. It slides. It's really a swamp upside down. On Sora Sea we had a very odd problem. Only the swamp was right to do there. We'd several hundred square miles of swamp that could be used if we could drain it. We built a soldum around it. You know the trick. You bore to rows of holes twenty feet apart and put soil accurgent in them. It's an old, old device. They used it a couple of hundred years ago back on Earth. The curcalant seeps out in all directions and, well, coagulates the dirt, makes it watertight. It wells with water and fills the space between the soil pratings. In a week or two, there's a watertight barrier made of soil going down to bedrock. You might call it a coffer dam. No water can seep through. On Sorosy, we knew that if we could get the water out of the mud inside this coffer dam, we'd have cultivable ground, Sandraham said spectacally. But it called for ten years pumping. And when mud doesn't move, pumping isn't easy. We wanted the soil, said Hartwick. And we didn't have ten years. The Sorosy colony was supposed to relieve populations on another planet. The pressure was terrific. We had to be ready to receive some colonists in eight months. We had to get the water out quicker than it could be pumped. And there was another problem mixed up with it. The swamp vegetation was pretty deadly. It had to be gotten rid of. Oh, so we made the dam and, well, took certain measures and then we irrigated it with water from a nearby river. It was very ticklish. But we had dry ground in four months with the swamp of Tasha can killed and turning back to humus. I ought to read your reports, said Sandra Hemdarley. I'm too busy, ordinarily, but I should read them. How do you get rid of the water? Hardwick told him. He felt uncomfortable about it. The telling required eighteen words. Of course, he added, we did pick a day when there was a strong wine from the right quarter. Sandra Hem stared at him. Then he said vexedly, But how does that apply? He would was sound enough, though I'd never have thought of it. But what's it got to do with the situation here, this swamp, you might say, said Hartwick, is underground, but there's forty feet, on an average, of soil on top. He explained painstakingly what difference that made. It took him three sentences to make the difference clear. Sandraham leaned back in his chair. Hardwick scratched the dough. Somewhat embarrassed, Sandraham thought concentratedly. I do not see any possible chance, said Sandraham distastfully, of doing it any other way. I would never have thought of that, but at least ninety per cent of the people on this island, civilian and survey together, will die if we don't do something. So we will do this. But I'm taking it out of your hands. Hardwick. Hardwick said nothing. He waited. The cause, said Sandra Hem. You're not the man to put over to the civilians what they must believe. You're not impressive. I know you. And I know you're a good man in a pinch. But this pinch needs a salesman. So I'm going to have Werner make the at pitch to the planetary government. Results are more important than justice. So Werner will front this affair. Hardwick winced a little. But Sandra Hem was right. He didn't know how to be impressive. He could not speak with pompous conviction, which is so much more convincing than reason. To most people, he wasn't the man to get the cooperation of the non-service population. 
because he could only explain what he knew and believed, and was not practiced in persuasion. But Werner was. He had the knack of making people believe anything, not because it was reasonable, but because it was oratory. I suppose you're right. Acknowledge Hardwick. We need civilian help and a lot of it. I'm not the man to get it. He is. He did not say anything about Werner being the man to get credit, whether he deserved it or not. He patted the dog's head and stood up. I wish I had a good supply of soul cogitate. I need to make a coffer dam in the reserve area here, but I think I'll manage. Sandraham regarded him soberly as he moved to the door. As he was about to pass out of it, Sandraham said, Hardwick would take good care of yourself. Will you have therefore senior officer Werner, of the colonial survey, received his instructions from Sandringham? Hardwick never knew the details of the instructions Werner got. They were possibly persuasive, or they may have been menacing. But Werner ceased to argue for the movement of any fraction of the island's population to the Arctic ice cap, and instead made frequent eloquent addresses to the planetary population on the scientific means by which their lives were to be saved. Between the addresses, perhaps, he sweated cold sweat when a tree sedately tilted in what had seemed solid soil, or a building settled perceptibly while he looked at it, or when, save, a section of the island's soul bulged upward. Publicly, he headed citizens' committees and grandly gave instructions, and spoke in unintelligible and, therefore, extremely scientific terms when desperately earnest men asked for explanations. But he was perfectly clear in what he wanted them to do. He wanted to drill holes in the arable soil down to the depth at which the holes began to close up of themselves. He wanted those holes not more than a hundred feet apart and lines which slanted at fortivewood degrees to the gradient of the bedrock. Sandraham checked his speeches, at the rate of four a day. Once he had Hardwick called away from where he supervised extremely improbable operations. Hardwick was smeared with the island's grayish mud when he looked into the fawn plate to take the call. Hardwick, said Sandraham curtly, Werner's saying those holes you want are to be lines at fort of wood degrees to the gradient. That, I'd like a little more, said Hartwick. A little less. Rather, if they slanted three miles across the grade for every two downhill, it would be better. I'd like to put a lot more lines of holes. But there's the element of time. I'll have him explain that he was misquoted, said Sandra Hem. Grimly, three across to two down. How close do you really want those lines? It's not how close, said Hartwick. I've got to have them quickly. How does the barometer look down a tent? said Sandra Hem. Hartwick said. Dan has he got plenty of labor, all the labor there is, said Sandra Hem. And I'm having a road laid along the cliffs for speed with the trucks. If I dared, and if I have the pack, and lay a pipeline. Mater, said Hordwick tiredly, if he's got labor to spare, set them to work turning the irrigation systems hind port before. Make them drainage systems. Use pumps. So a frame does come it won't be spread out on the land by all the pretty ditches. So it will be gathered instead and either flung back over the cliffs or else drained downhill without getting a chance to sink into the ground. For the time being, Anyhow, Sandraham said evenly, has it occurred to you what a good pounding rain would do to headquarters, and consequently to public confidence on this island, and therefore to the attempt of anybody to do anything but wring his hands because he was doomed Hardwick grimaced. I'm irrigating. Here, I've got a small Zid's lake made, and an ice coffer dam, and the water fershin is working around the clock. If there is labor, tell them to fix the irrigation systems into drainage layites. That will cheer them. Anyhow, he was very weary. Then, there is a certain exhausting quality in the need to tell other men to do work which may cause them to be killed spectacularly. The fact that one will certainly be killed with them does not lessen the tension. He went back to his work. 
and it definitely seemed to be as purposeless as any man's work could possibly be downgrade from the now thoroughly deserted area in which ship fuel tanks had leaked which far downgrade had commandeered all the refrigeration equipment in the warehouses since refrigeration was necessary for fuel storage there was a great deal he had planted iron pipe in the salt and circulated refrigerant in it and presently there was a wall of solidly frozen nert which was shaped like a shallow u it was a coffer dam in the curved part of that u he'd siphoned out a lake a peristatic pump prancy water from the islands lee out upon the ground where it instantly turned to mud on another peristatic pump sucked the mud up again and delivered it down grade beyond the line of frigia spans it was in fact a system of hydraulic dredging such as is normally performed in rivers and harbors but when topsoil is merely former abyssal mud it is an excellent way tomb of dirt also it does not require anybody to strike blows into soil which may be explosive when one has gotten down near bedrock and in particular there are no clanking machines but it was hair rising in one day though he had a sizable lake pumped out and he pumped it out to emptiness painstakingly smelling the water as it went down to a greater depth below the previous ground surface at the end of the day he shivered and ordered pumping ended for the time but then he had the brine key played around a great circuit to the headquarters ground which was upgrade from the now as ritted square mile or so in which the fuel tanks lay deep in the searle it here also he performed excavation without the sound of hammer shovel or pick he thrust paps into the grind and they had nozzles at the end which threw part of the water backward so that when sea water poured into them it thrust them deeper into the ground by the backward jet action again the fact that the soil was abyssal mud made it possible the nozzles floated up much grayish mud but they bored a head down to bedrock and there they lay flat and tundled to one side in the other tunnels they made being full of water at all times from those tunnels as they extended an astonishing amount of sea water seeped out into the soil near bedrock but it was sea water it was heavily mineralized and it is a peculiarity of sea water that it is an electrotile and it is a property of electrotiles that they coagulate collins and rather definitely discourage the suspension of small solid particles which are on the borderline of being collins in fact the water of the ocean of canny returned the ground's whale into good honest mud which did not feel at all serpent and through which it percolated with a surprising readiness young barnes eagerly supervised this part of the operation once it was begun he chained the survey personnel assigned to him into perhaps excessive self-confidence he knows what he's doing he said firmly love he rile take that canteen it's fresh water here's some soaked put it in fresh water and it lathers see it dissolves now right to dissolve it in sea water try it see they put salt in the boiled stuff to separate soap out when they make it he'd picked up that item from hardwick sea water won't soften the ground it can't come on but let's get another pack putting more salt water underground his workmen did not understand what he was doing but they labored zestfully because it was mysterious and for a purpose but downhill in the hydrodolarcutal lake water came seeping in in the form of mud and then another pack came up from the seashore and the mud settled solidly on the bottom not dispersing it was a rather small pipe and the personnel who laid it were bewildered because there was a water freshening plant down there on the shore and all the fresh water was poured back overboard while the brinus waited with salts from the ocean unable to dissolve a single grain of anything else was being used to fill the small artificial lake the second day sanraham called hardwick again and again hardwick peered warily into the phobes and reek yes said hartwick the leaked fuel is turning up in solution i'm trying to measure the concentration by matching specific gravities of lake water and brine and then sticking electrodes in each the fuel's corrosive as the devil it gives a different temp higher than brine of the same density i think i've got it in hand 
Do you want to start shipping it? demanded Sandringham. You can begin pouring it down holes, said Hartwick. How is the barometer down three nips this morning? Steady now, Fam said Hartwick. I'll set up molds, freeze it in plastic bags the size of the boreholes so it will go down. While it's frozen, they can even push it down deep, Sandringham said very grimly. There's been more than technical work done with ship fuel than any other substance since time began. But remember that the stuff can still be set off. Even dissolved in water, its sensitivity goes down. But it's not gone if it were, said Hardwick drearily. You could invite in the civilian population to sit on its rump. I've got something like forty tons of ship fuel in brine solution in this lake I pumped out, but it's in five thousand tons of brine. We don't speak above a whisper when we're around it. We walk in carpet slippers, and you never saw people so polite we will start freezing it. How can you handle it? demanded Sandringham apprehensively. The brine freezes at minus thirty, said Hartwick. In one percent solution, it's only five percent sensitive at minus nineteen. We are handling it at minus nineteen. I think I'll step up the brine and chill it a little more. He waved a must marred hand and went away. That day, Ballstritz began to roll out of survey headquarters. They rolled very, very smoothly, and they trailed a fog of chilled air behind them. And presently there were men with heavy gloves on their hands taking long things like sausages out of the bowl strits and tying the ends and lowering them down into holes bored in the top sole until they reached places where wetness made the holes close up again. Then the men from survey pushed those frozen sausages underground still further by along poles with carefully padded and refrigerants. And then they went on to other holes. The first day there were five hundred such sausages thrust down in two holes in the ground, which holes to all intents and purposes closed up behind them. The second day there were four thousand. The third day there were eight. On the fourth the solution of ship fuel and brine in the lake did not give adequate temp in the little batterless design to show how much corrosive substance there was in the brine. Hardwick took samples from the fluid draining into the lake. It was not mud any longer. Bran flowed at the top of bedrock, and it left the mud behind it. Because salt water remarkably hindered the suspension of former globigri in Asu's particles, it was practically colored. Salt water practically coagulated it. The brine flowing from the salt water tunnels upward and showed no more ship fuel in it. Hard with cold, Sandraham and told him, "I can call in the civilians." Said Sandraham, "You've mopped up the leaked stuff. It couldn't have been done not anywhere but here, with bedrock handy just underneath." And slanting, said Hartwick, but I wouldn't advise it. Tell them they can come if they want to. They'll sort of drift in. I want to tap some more ship fuel for the rest of those boreholes from the tanks that haven't leaked. Sandringham hesitated. Twenty thousand holes, said Hartwick tiredly. Each one had a six crundered block of frozen saturated brine dumped in it. With roughly one pound of ship fuel in solution, you have gone that far. Might as well go the rest of the way. How's the barometer up a tent? Said Sandringham, still rising. Hardwick blinked at him, because he had trouble keeping his eyes open now. Let's ride it. Sandringham. Sandringham hesitated. Then he said, "Go ahead." Hardwick waved his arms at his associates. Whom he admired with great fervor in his fanfoby mind, because they were always ready to work when it was needed, and it had not stopped being needed for five days running. He explained very lucidly that there were only three more miles of holes to be filled up, and therefore they would just draw so much of ship fuel and blend it carefully with an appropriate amount of suitable chilled brine, and then freeze it in appropriate sausages. Young Lieutenant Barnes said gravely, "Yes, so." I'll take care of it. You remember me, so I'll take care of it. Hardwick said, "Barometers up a tent." His eyes did not quite focus. All right, Lieutenant. Bow ahead. Promising young officer. Excellent. I'll sit down here for just a moment. When Barnes came back, Hardwick was asleep. 
and the last 150 frozen sausages of brine and ship fuel went out of headquarters within a matter of hours, and then a vast quaint had settled down everywhere. Young Barn sat beside Hardwick, menacing anybody who even thought of disturbing him. When Senraham called for him, Barnes went to the phone plate. So, he said with vast formality, Mr. Hardwick went five days without sleep. His job's done. I won't wake him. Sir Sandraham raised his eyebrows. You won't, I won't. So said young Barnes. Sandraham nodded. Fortunately, he observed, no Bobby's listening. You are quite right. He snapped the connection. And then young Barnes realized that he had defied a sector chief which is something distinctly more improper in a junior officer than nearly trying to instruct him in topping off his vacuum suit tanks. Twelve hours later, however, Sandraham called for him. Barometers dropping. Lieutenant, I'm concerned. I'm issuing a notice of the impending storm. Not everybody will crowd in on us, but a great many will. I'm explaining that the chemicals put into the bottom soul may not quite have finished their work. If Hardwick wakens, tell him. Yes, so said Barnes, but he did not intend to wake Hardwick. Hardwick, however, woke of himself at the end of twenty hours of sleep. He was stiff and sore, and his mind tasted as if something had kittened in it. Fatigue can produce a hangover. The How's the barometer? he asked when his eyes came open. Drapping. Sowed. Heavy winds. Sowed. The sector chief has opened the reserve area. Sowed. To the civilians if they wish to come. Hardwick computed dizzily on his fingers. A more complex instrument was actually needed. Of course, one does not calculate on one's fingers just how long a one per cent solution of ship fuel in frozen brine has taken to melt and how completely it has diffused through an upside-down swamp with the pressure of forty feet of soul on top of it, and therefore its effective concentration and dispersal underground. I think, said Hartwick, it's all right. By the way, did they turn the irrigation system's hind end to young Barnes did not know what this was all about. He had to send for information. Meanwhile, he solicitously plied Hardwick with coffee and food, Hardwick grew reflective. Queer, he said. You think of the damage forty tons of ship fuel can do, setting off the rest of the store and all. But even by itself it rates some thousands of tons of TT. I wonder what TT was. Before it became a tomashu of energy, you think of it exploding in one place. And it's appalling, but think of all that same amount of energy applied to square miles of ups tie downs swamp. Hundreds or thousands of miles of upside down swamp. I know, Lieutenant. On Sora Sea, we pumped a ship fuel solution onto a swamp we wanted to drain, flooded it, and let it soak until a day came with a nice, strong, steady wine. Yes, so said Barnes respectfully. Then we detonated it. We didn't have a one per cent solution. It was more like a thousandth of one per cent solution. Nobody's ever measured the speed of propagation of an explosion in ship fuel. Try, but it's been measured in dilute solution. It isn't the speed of sound. It's slower. It's purely a temper of fentriant. On water, at any dilution, ship fuel goes off just barely below the boiling tinge of water. It doesn't detonate from shock when it's diluted enough to be all iron as with it's that takes a hell of a lot of dilution. Have you got some more coffee? Yes. Sowed, said Barnes. Coming up. Sowed, we floated ship fuel solution over that swamp, Barnes, and let it stand. It has a high diffusionator. It went down into the mud on there came a day when the wind was right. I dumped a red hot iron bar into the swamp water that had ship fuel in solution. It was the weirdest sight you ever saw Barnes served him more coffee and Hardwick sipped it, and it burned his tank. It went up in steam. He said, the swamp water that had the ship fuel dissolved in it, it didn't explode. As a mass, 
They told me later that it propagated at hundreds of feet per second only. They could see the wall of steam go marching across the swamp. Not even Hypersware's team. There was a whoosh and a cloud of steam half a mile high that the wind carried away. And all the surface water in the swamp was gone. And all the swamp pigtaship and parbled and dead. So he on Sudenweiler had a ten mile by fifth mile stretch of arable ground ready for the coming colonists. He tried the coffee again. He added reflectively, That trick it didn't explode the ship fuel. In a way, it burned it on water. It applied the energy of the fuel to the boiling wall of water. Powerful stuff we got rid of two feet of water on an average, counting what came out of the mud. It cast hems, a fraction of a gram per square yard. He gulped the coffee down. There were men looking at him solicitously. They seemed very glad to see him awake again. There was a monstrous bank of clouts spot piling up in the sky. He suddenly blinked at that. Hello, how long did I sleep? Barnes Barnes told him. Hardwick shook his head to clear it. We'll go see Sandraham, said Hartwick. Heavily. I'd like to purse pond firing as long as I can. Short of having the stuff start draining into the sea to leeward. There were mud-stained men around the place where Hardwick had slept. When he went still groggy to the bowl struck young Barnes had waiting. They regarded Hardwick in a very satisfying manner. Somebody grunted. Good to have worked with you. So, which is about as much of admiration as anybody would want to hear expressed. These associates of Hardwick in the mupping puck of leaked ship's fuel would be able to brag of the job at all times and in all places hereafter. Then the truck went trundling away in search of Sandraham. It found him on the cliffs to the windward side of the island. The sea was no longer a surly and blue. It was slat a -clore. There were occasional flecks of white foam on the water four thousand feet below. There were dark clouds, by then covering practically all the sky. Car out to sea, there were small craft heading grimly for the ends of the island, to go around it and ride out the coming storm in its lee. Sandraham greeted Hardwick with relief. Werner stood close by opening and closing his hands jerkily. Hardwick said the sector chief cordially, We are having a disagreement. Warner and died. He's confident that the turning of the irrigation systems hind end to making them surpass drain systems. And Neftwitz take care of the whole situation. Adding the brine underground. He six. We'll have done a good deal more. He says it'll be bad. Psychologically. For anything more to be done. He didn't speak of it, and it would injure public confidence in the survey. Hardwick said curtly, The only thing that will make a permanent difference on this island is for the water fursions to be a little less efficient. Barnes has the figures. He computed them from some measurements I had him make. If the water fursion plants don't take all the sea minerals out, if they don't make the irrigate knittered so infernally soft and suitable for hair wishing and the like, if they turn out hard water for irrigation. This won't happen again, but there's too much water underground now. We have got to get it out. Because a little more is going underground from this storm. Surfasterane systems or no surfasterane systems. Sandraham pointed to leeward, where a black, thick procession of human beings trooped toward the survey area on foot and by every possible type of vehicle, I've ordered them turned into the ships and warehouses, said the sector chief. But of course we haven't shelter for all of them. At a guess, when they feel safe they'll go back to their homes even through the storm. The sky to windward grew blacker and blacker. There was no longer a steady flow of wind coming over the cliff's edge. It came in gusts, but of extreme violence. They could make a man stagger on his feet. There were more flecks of white on the ocean surface. The boats, added Sandraham, were licked. There simply wasn't enough oil to maintain the slick. The radio reports were getting hysterical before I ordered them told that we had it beaten on shore. They're running for shelter now. I think they'd have stayed at there trying to hold the slick in place with their tow line. If I hadn't said we had matters in hand, 
Warner said, tight-lipped. I hope we had Hardwick shrugged. The wind's good and strong. But, he observed, let's find out. You've got the starting system all set, Sandraham waved his hand. There was a high voltage battery set. It was of a type designed for blasting on airless planets. But that did not matter. Its cables led snappily for a couple of hundred feet to a very small pile of grayish soil which had been taken out of a borehole. They went over that untidy heap and down into the ground. Hardwick took hold of the firing fiddle. He posed. How about high was he asked? There might be some steam out of this hole. All allowed for, said Sandrahem. Bow ahead. There was a gust of wine strong enough to knock a man down. There was a humming sound in the air. A storm wind beat upon the four thousand watt cliff and poured over its stock. There were gradually rising waves. Below, the sky was gray. The sea was slate kilder. Far, far to windward. The white line of pouring rain upon the water came marching toward the island. Hardwick pumped the firing findle. There was a pause. While wing dust stored at his garments and staggered him where he stood. It was quite a long pause. Then a white vapor came seeping out of the borehole. It was perfectly white. Then it came out with a sudden burst which was not in any sense explosive, but was merely a vast rushing of vaporized water. Then, a hundred yards away, there was a mistiness on the grassy surface. Still farther, a crack in the surfacely let out a curtain of white vapor. Here and there, everywhere, Little gouts of steam poured into the air and tumbled in the storm wind. It was notable that the steam did not come out as an invisible vapor and condense in midair. It poured out of the ground in clouds, already condensed but thrust out by more masses of vapor behind it. It was not superheated steam that came out. It was simply steam, harmless steam, like the steam out of the spouts of tea kettles but it rose from individual places everywhere. It made a massy coating of vapor which the storm wind blew away. In seconds a half lion of soil was venting steam. In seconds more a mile. The thick, fleecy vapor swept across the landscape. The storm wind could only tumble it and sweep it away. In minutes there was no part of the island to be seen at all, save only the thin line of the cliffs reaching away between dark water on the one hand and snow-white clouds of vapor on the other. It can't scold anybody. Can it? asked Barnes uneasily. That, said Hartwick, when it's had to come up through forty feet of Searle. It's been pretty well cooled off and taking up some extra moisture. It spread pretty well. Didn't it? The sector chief's office had tall windizers. Relafate looked out upon green lawn and many trees. Now a downpour of rain beat down outside, wind whipped at the trees. There was tumult and roaring and the vibration of gusts of hurricane force. Even the building in which the sector chief's office was vibrated slightly in the wind. The sector chief beamed. The brown dog came in and easily looked around the room and walked in leisurely fashion toward Hardwick. He settled with a sigh beside Hardwick's chair. What I want to know said Werner tensely. His what this rain put back all the water the ship fuel boiled away Hardwick said uncomfortably. Two inches of rain would be a heavy fall. Sandraham tells me. It's the lack of heavy rains that made the civilians start irrigating. When you figure then rojectant of ship fuel, Werner an appreciable fraction of the energy in atomic explosivity sort of deceptive Turn it into thermal units and it gets to be enlightening. We turned loose. Underground. Enough heat to boil away two feet of salt water under the island's whole surface. Warner said sharply, What'll happen when that heat passes up through the so little kill the vegetation? Want it no, said Hardwick mildly. Because there was two feet of water to be turned to steam, the bottom layer of the sorrel was raised to the temperature of steam at a few pounds pressure. No more. The heat's already escaped. In the steam, the phone plate lighted. Sandraham snapped it on. A voice made a report in a highly official voice. Right, said Sandraham. 
The highly official voice spoke again. Right, said Sandrahem again. You may tell the ships in orbit that they can come down now, if they don't mind getting wet. He turned. Did you hear that? Hardwick they have bore new cores. There are a few soggy spots, but the ground's as firm all over the island as it was when the survey first came here. A very good job. Hardwick a very good job. Hardwick flutched. He reached down and patted the head of the brown dog. Look, said the sector chief. My vol. There. Has taken a liking to you. Will you accept him as a present? Hardwick Hardwick grinned. Young Barnes made ready to rejoin his ship. He was very strictly service. Very stiffly at attention. Hardwick shook hands with him. Nice to have had you round. Lieutenant. He said warmly. You're a very promising young officer. Sandrahem knows it and has made a note of the fact, which I suspect is going to put you to a lot of trouble. There's a devilish shortage of promising young officers. He'll give you hellish jobs to do, because he has an idea and you'll do them. I've tried. So, said young Barnes formally. Then he said awkwardly, May I say something? So I'm very proud. So, to have worked with you. But damn it. So, it seems to me that something more than just saying thank you was do you the service. So, ought to Hardwick regarded the young man approvingly. When I was your age, he said, at the very same attitude, but I had the only reward the service or anything else could give me. The job got done. It's the only reward you can expect in the service. Barnes, you'll never get any other. Young Barnes looked rebellious. He shook hands again. Besides, said Hartwick, there is no better. Young Barnes marched back toward his ship in the great metal criss-cross of girders, which was the land grid. Hardwick absently patted his derb. He headed back toward Sandraham's office for his orders to return to his own work. The end end of the Project Gutenberg Gebok the Swampras Upside Down updated editions will replace the previous one the old editions will be renamed, creating the works from print editions not protected by you. S. Copyright law means that no one owns a United States copyright in these works. So the Foundation and you can copy and distribute it in the United States without permission and without paying copyright royalties. Special rules set forth in the general terms of use part of this license. Applied to copying and distributing Project Gutenberg to electronic works to protect the Project Gutenberg concept and trademark. Project Gutenberg is a registered trademark and may not be used if you charge for an ebook, except by following the terms of the trademark license, including paying royalties for use of the Project Gutenberg trademark. If you do not charge anything for copies of this ebook, complying with the trademark license is very easy. You may use this ebook for nearly any purpose, such as creation of derivative works, reports, performances, and research. Project Gutenberg ebooks may be modified and printed and given a yewa may do practically anything in the United States with ebooks not protected by you. S. Copyright law. Redistribution is subject to the trademark license, especially commercial redistribution. Start. Full license. The full Project Gutenberg license. Please read this before you distribute or use this work to protect the Project Gutenberg mission of promoting the free distribution of electronic works. By using or distributing this work or any other work associated in any way with the phrase Project Gutenberg, you agree to comply with all the terms of the full Project Gutenberg license available with this file or online at WAF. Gutenberg. Orgel Cecent. Section 1. General Terms of Use and Redistributing Project Utenabrum to Electronic Works 1. At by reading or using any part of this Project Utenabrum to Electronic Work, you indicate that you have read, understand, agree to and accept all the terms of this license and intellectual property trademark Witic agreement. If you do not agree to abide by all the terms of this agreement, you must cease using and return or destroy all copies of Project Gutenberg to electronic works in your possession. 
if you paid a fee for obtaining a copy of or access to a project utnabrum to electronic work and you do not agree to be bound by the terms of this agreement you may obtain a refund from the person or entity to whom you paid the fee as set forth in paragraph one oh. one well project gutenberg is a registered trademark it may only be used on or associated in any way with an electronic work by people who agree to be bound by the terms of this agreement there are a few things that you can do with most project utnabrum to electronic works even without complying with the full terms of this agreement see paragraph one see below there are a lot of things you can do with project utnabrum to electronic works if you follow the terms of this agreement and help preserve free future access to project utnabrum to electronic works see paragraph one e below one so the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, the Foundation, or GLAF, owns a compilation copyright in the collection of Project Utnabrum to Electronic Works. Nearly all the individual works in the collection are in the public domain in the United States. If an individual work is unprotected by copyright law in the United States and you are located in the United States, we do not claim a right to prevent you from copying, distributing, performing, displaying or creating derivative works based on the work as long as all references to Project Gutenberg are removed. Of course, we hope that you will support the Project Gutenberg mission of promoting free access to electronic works by freely sharing Project Gutenberg works in compliance with the terms of this agreement for keeping the Project Gutenberg name associated with the work. You can easily comply with the terms of this agreement by keeping this work in the same format with its attached full project Utnabrum license when you share it without charge with others. 1. Mm -hmm. The copyright laws of the place where you are located also govern what you can do with this work. Copyright laws in most countries are in a constant state of change. If you are outside the United States, Check the laws of your country in addition to the terms of this agreement before downloading, copying, displaying, performing, distributing or creating derivative works based on this work or any other project Utnabrumt work. The Foundation makes no representations concerning the copyright status of any work in any country other than the United States. One, oh, unless you have removed all references to Project Gutenberg. One, oh, one, the following sentence, with active links to, or other immediate access to, the full Project Utnabrumt license must appear prominently whenever any copy of a Project Utnabrumt work any work on which the phrase Project Gutenberg appears, or with which the phrase Project Gutenberg is associated is accessed, displayed, performed, you, copied or distributed. This evoke is for the use of anyone anywhere in the United States and most other parts of the world at no cost and with almost no restrictions whatsoever. You may copy it, give it away or reuse it under the terms of the Project Gutenberg license included with this evoke or online at WAF. Gutenberg, or if you are not located in the United States, you will have to check the laws of the country where you are located before using this evoke. One, oh, so, if an individual project Gutenberg to electronic work is derived from texts not protected by you, as copyright law does not contain a notice indicating that it is posted with permission of the copyright holder, the work can be copied and distributed to anyone in the United States without paying any fees or charges. If you are redistributing or providing access to a work with the phrase Project Gutenberg associated with or appearing on the work, you must comply either with the requirements of paragraphs 1, oh, 1 through 1, oh, 7, or obtain permission for the use of the work and the Project Utnabrumt trademark as set forth in paragraphs 1, oh, 8, or 1, oh, and 1, oh, 3. If an individual Project Utnabrumt electronic work is posted with the permission of the copyright holder, your use and distribution must comply with both paragraphs 1, oh, 1 through 1, oh, 7 and any additional terms imposed by the copyright holder. 
Additional terms will be linked to the Project Gutnabrumt license for all works posted with the permission of the copyright holder found at the beginning of this work. 1. Oh, 4. Do not unlink cord attach or remove the full Project Gutnabrumt license terms from this work or any files containing a part of this work or any other work associated with Project Gutnabrumt. 1. Oh, 5. Do not copy. Display. Perform. Distribute or redistribute this electronic work or any part of this electronic work without prominently displaying the sentence set forth in paragraph 1. Oh, 1. With active links or immediate access to the full terms of the Project Gutnabrumt license. 1. Oh, 6. You may convert to and distribute this work in any binary. Compressed. Marked up non-proprietary or proprietary form, including any word processing or hypertext form. However, if you provide access to or distribute copies of a Project Utnabrumpt work in a format other than plain vanilla ASCII or other format used in the official version posted on the official Project Utnabrumpt website WAF, Gutenberg, or you must, at no additional cost, fee or expense to the user, provide a copy a means of exporting a copy, or a means of obtaining a copy upon request, of the work in its original plain vanilla ASCII or other form. Any alternate format must include the full Project Utnabrumt license as specified in paragraph 1. Oat. 1. 1. Oat. 7. Do not charge a fee for access to viewing, displaying, performing, copying or distributing any Project Utnabrumpt works unless you comply with Paragraph 1. Oat. Eight or one. Oat. Ban. One. Oat. Eight. You may charge a reasonable fee for copies of or providing access to or distributing Project Utnabrumpt electronic works provided that you pay a royalty fee of 20 of the gross profits you derive from the use of Project Utnabrumpt works calculated using the method you already use to calculate your applicable taxes. The fee is owed to the owner of the Project Utnabrumpt trademark. But he has agreed to donate royalties under this paragraph to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation. Royalty payments must be paid within 60 days following each date on which you prepare or are legally required to prepare your periodic tax returns. Royalty payments should be clearly marked as such and sent to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation at the address specified in Section 4. Information about donations to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation. You provide a full refund of any money paid by a user who notifies you in writing or by email within 30 days of receipt that she does not agree to the terms of the full Project Utnabrumpt license. You must require such a user to return or destroy all copies of the works possessed in a physical medium and discontinue all use of and all access to other copies of Project Utnabrumpt works. You provide an accordance with Paragraph 1. At 3. A full refund of any money paid for a work or a replacement copy. If a defect in the electronic work is discovered and reported to you within 90 days of receipt of the work, you comply with all other terms of this agreement for free distribution of Project Utnabrumpt works. 1. Oat. Band. If you wish to charge a fee or distribute a Project Utnabrumpt electronic or core group of works on different terms than are set forth in this agreement, you must obtain permission in writing from the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, the manager of the Project Gutenberg trademark. Contact the Foundation as set forth in Section 3 below. 1. F. 1. F. 1. Project Gutenberg volunteers and employees expend considerable effort to identify. To copyright research on. Transcribe and proofread works not protected by you. S. Copyright law in creating the Project Utnabrumpt collection. Despite these efforts, Project Utnabrumpt electronic works and the medium on which they may be stored may contain defects, such as, but not limited to, incomplete, inaccurate or corrupt dated, transcription errors, 
a copyright or other intellectual property infringement, a defective or damaged disk or other medium, a computer virus, or computer codes that damage or cannot be read by your equipment. 1. Absolute limited warranty. Disclaimer of damages except for the right of replacement or refund described in paragraph 1. Absolute 3. The Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, the owner of the Project Gutenberg trademark and any other party distributing a project Gutenberg to electronic work under this agreement, disclaim all liability to you for damages, costs and expenses, including legal fees. You agree that you have no remedies for negligence, strict liability, breach of warranty or breach of contract except those provided in paragraph 1. At 3, you agree that the Foundation, the trademark honor, and any distributor under this agreement will not be liable to you for actual, direct, indirect, consequential, punitive or incidental damages even if you give notice of the possibility of such damage. 1. F. 3. Limited right of replacement or refund if you discover a defect in this electronic work within 90 days of receiving it. You can receive a refund of the money if any you paid for it by sending a written explanation to the person you received the work from. If you received the work on a physical medium, you must return the medium with your written explanation. The person or entity that provided you with the defective work may elect to provide a replacement copy in lieu of a refund. If you received the work electronically, the person or entity providing it to you may choose to give you a second opportunity to receive the work electronically in lieu of a refund. If the second copy is also defective, you may demand a refund in writing without further opportunities to fix the problem. 1. F. 4. Except for the limited right of replacement or refund set forth in paragraph 1. F. 3. This work is provided to you ASIS with no other warranties of any kind, express or implied, including but not limited to warranties of mercantility or fitness for any purpose. 1. F. 5. Some states do not allow disclaimers of certain implied warranties or the exclusion or limitation of certain types of damages. If any disclaimer or limitation set forth in this agreement violates the law of the state applicable to this agreement, the agreement shall be interpreted to make the maximum disclaimer or limitation permitted by the applicable state law. The invalidity or unenfranchability of any provision of this agreement shall not void the remaining provisions. 1. F. 6. Indemnity you agree to indemnify and hold the foundation. The trademark honor. Any agent or employee of the foundation any one providing copies of Project Utnabrum to electronic works in accordance with this agreement, and any volunteers associated with the production, promotion and distribution of Project Utnabrum to electronic works, harmless from all liability, costs and expenses, including legal fees, that arise directly or indirectly from any of the following which you do or cause to occur, a distribution of this or any Project Utnabrum work, be alteration, modification, or additions or deletions to any Project Utnabrum work, and see any defect you cause. Section 2. Information about the mission of Project Utnabrum. Project Utnabrum is synonymous with the free distribution of electronic works in formats readable by the widest variety of computers including obsolete, of middle-aged and new computers. It exists because of the efforts of hundreds of volunteers and donations from people in all walks of life. Volunteers and financial support to provide volunteers with the assistance they need are critical to reaching Project Utnabrum's goals and ensuring that the Project Utnabrum collection will remain freely available for generations to come. In 2001, the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation was created to provide a secure and permanent future for Project Gutenberg and future generations. To learn more about the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation and how your efforts and donations can help, 
See sections free and foreign the foundation information page at WAF. Gutenberg. Org section 3. Information about the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation. The Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation is an unprofit 500 own free educational corporation organized under the laws of the state of Mississippi and granted tax exempt status by the Internal Revenue Service. The foundation's INOR federal tax identification number is 6 Tifturus million, 221,548. Contributions to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation are tax deductible to the full extent permitted by you. S. Federal Laws and Your State's Laws. The Foundation's business office is located at 809 North 1500 West. Salt Lake City at 84,116. 801 509 Tixtiv and Satixton. Email contact links and up-to-date contact information can be found at the Foundation's website and official page at WUF. Gutenberg, Org Architect Section 4. Information about donations to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation Project Gutenberg depends upon and cannot survive without widespread public support and donations to carry out its mission of increasing the number of public domain and licensed works that can be freely distributed in mechani rivet form accessible by the widest array of equipment including outdated equipment. Many small donations $1 to $5 Zero are particularly important to maintaining tax-exempt status with the laws. The Foundation is committed to complying with the laws regulating charities and charitable donations in all 50 states of the United States. Compliance requirements are not uniform and it takes a considerable effort. Much paperwork and many fees to meet and keep up with these requirements. We do not solicit donations in locations where we have not received written confirmation of compliance. To send donations or determine the status of compliance for any particular state visit WUF. Gutenberg. Orgadot. While we can often do not solicit contributions from states where we have not met the solicitation requirements. We know of no prohibition against accepting unsolicited donations from donors in such states who approach us with offers to donate. International donations are gratefully accepted. But we cannot make any statements concerning tax treatment of donations received from outside the United States. Lo. S. Laws alone swamp power small staff. Please check the Project Gutenberg web pages for current donation methods and addresses. Donations are accepted in a number of other ways, including checks, online payments, and credit card donations. To donate, Please visit WAF Gutenberg Orgadot Section 5 General Information about Project Gutenberg to Electronic Works Professor Michael Less. Hart was the originator of the Project Gutenberg concept of a library of electronic works that could be freely shared with anyone. For 40 years, he produced and distributed Project Gutenberg to books with only a loose network of volunteer support. Project Gutenberg Tebooks are often created from several printed editions, all of which are confirmed as not protected by copyright in the U.S. Unless a copyright notice is included. Thus, we do not necessarily keep Tebooks in compliance with any particular paper edition. Most people start at our website, which has the main PGF search facility. Waf Gutenberg. Org. This website includes information about Project Gutenberg, including how to make donations to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, how to help produce our new ebooks, and how to subscribe to our email newsletter to hear about new ebooks.